There we go. Mm -hmm. um, everybody from the IOBIN training initiative already knows this. So we uh, record all of this so that people can watch it later. And so welcome everybody to Unlocking Interdisciplinary Research. I'm glad to see you right here. And Michaela and me, we are both students who are actually part of the IUBNB training initiative. This is the International Union for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology training initiative. And together with the FAPS junior section, the Federal European Biochemical Society's junior section, we have set up this event basically for everybody who's interested in interdisciplinary research and especially in neuroimmunology. And what we want to do right at the beginning is to give you a feeling of who we are and maybe which associations could be interested to you if you want to promote your own career or your own research. So I've mentioned this FAPS junior section and you will see um, they are quite similar to the IUBNB train initiative. So um, these are young members from research associations in Europe. And basically they try to promote the mobility and exchange of young scientists in Europe and also basically try to promote your career. And so what we do is we have a monthly talk series and we will come back to this at the very end of the event where basically the most interesting people from science, but also from the industry give talks to share their experiences and their knowledge. We have some networking events like the speed dating you can see here. Um, this was actually on, on the 18th of May where you would basically meet people all across Europe, exchange some experiences and thoughts and an online platform to connect. So you can just scan this QR code here and basically get going with the FAB Junior section. Um, if this is of interest to you. Um, so like Patrick mentioned, the UB UBMB training initiative is an uh, organization of young scientists, young uh, molecular biologists and biochemists. So the UBMB training initiative is a branch organization of International Union of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. And our goal is to bring together scientists from all around the world through initiatives and educational events such as this one. We are organized into regions, so European, African, Asian, and Oceanian, and Pan American region. And our initiative is run by trainees for trainees. So, whatever you're a student in high school, undergraduate, master, or a PhD student or a uh, postdoctoral researcher, we hope and we aim to uh, that our activities and resources help uh, you and navigate you through your journey into the difficult but very wonderful life of biochemistry and molecular biology. Um, also, there's uh, uh, International Society of Neuroimmunology. Uh, it is an organization which gathers experts from neuroimmunology from all around the world. Uh, with, uh, with a mission to further uh, knowledge on neuroimmunology and their mechanism and their implication in various uh, human diseases. Also, uh, they encourage the generation and uh, the interchange of, of ideas by organizing seminars and symposiums and publishing the materials on the neuroimmunology, such as the Sixth International Congress of Neuroimmunology, which is soon. Uh, also, you can find a lot of useful information on their website. And for younger researchers, there is a ESNE Young, whose committee aims to build a strong community for young neuroimmunology researchers. Exactly. And then finally, what we got is the International Brain Research Organization for you. And these guys are quite uh, like the other ones we have presented to you, right? So here you can find funding training opportunities for all the career stages within neuroscientific or brain research, right? So they sponsor some conferences they have, they have their own journals basically. And of course, um, if you're a part of them, you have travel grants, exchange fellowships, and of course, they also have, so to say, um, a group for, for younger researchers as well. And here you can just stand a QR code and basically get in touch with them as well. And why did we show you all of this? Basically to encourage you, to motivate you, showing you that there are so many initiatives out there which you can join if you want to promote your career, if you want to get out there and get in touch with people. 
because often it seems like you read a paper or two and it's also very distant, but actually it's not. The research world is very connected and this is basically your chance to, to become part of it and to really also benefit from all the opportunities they offer to you. And with that, I pass it over to Michaela and then also to um, Dr. Wolf, starting with the first presentation. Right, thank you, Patrick. And we are off to our first session of today, the short talks. And it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Clifford Wolf who is the director of the Kirby Neurobiology Center, as well as the Neurobiology Program at uh, Boston Children's Hospital. He and his research group are devoted to the study of pain and the regeneration of the injured uh, adult nervous system using a multidisciplinary approach, spanning off from molecular biology and basic cellular biology to neuro neuroanatomy and behavior. Um, Dr. Wolf, thank you, welcome, and thank you for joining us today, and uh, we're eager, eager to have it in your presentation. Great, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. So what I'd like to share with you is the work that we've been doing about interactions between sensory neurons and the immune and nervous system. Um, inflammation, um, it's interesting that when a Celsius the wolf, uh, as I'll discuss, is due to neurogenic inflammation, the, the heat, the same thing due to the vasodilation induced. neurons that are um, designed by evolution to inform us about potential danger in the environment. Uh, and these constitute what we call noxious stimuli. And they do that by virtue of the expression of specific ion channels that recognize damaging stimuli, such as trip B1, trip A1. And um, in 2021, uh, David Julius and Adam Pataputian got Nobel Prizes for identifying uh, these transducer proteins. For a long time, it's been recognized that immune cells do make inflammatory mediators that can act on nociceptors to produce a phenomenon known as peripheral sensitization, which reduces their threshold so that they are no longer need to be activated by noxious stimuli, but normally innocuous stimuli can begin to activate them. And that's one of the key features of inflammatory pain hypersensitivity. And the inflammatory mediators that have been studied over the last few decades include nerve growth factor, prostaglandin E2, um, and histamine. And obviously, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which is the most commonly used treatment for inflammatory pain, acts by reducing PG2 synthesis by cyclooxygenase. However, uh, it has been uh, increasingly recognized that sensory neurons that both the immune and the sensory system can detect many of the same signals. For a long time, it's been recognized that sensory neurons do have some impact on the uh, peripheral vascular system. And this is what is known as neurogenic inflammation. And neuropeptides that are released by the peripheral terminals of these afferents act on capillaries and, uh, and blood vessels and cause vasodilation and capillary permeability. And that contributes to the uh, both swelling and, and redness that is associated with inflammatory conditions. However, what I'd like to uh, describe with you is something that has only begun to be appreciated in the last few years, which is that neuropeptides released by nociceptors also have a major impact on immune cells themselves. And uh, this involves um, a, uh, an effect on hemotaxis and the activation, so it's the recruitment of, uh, of immune cells to a particular uh, tissue, as well as the activation of resident immune cells. 
the priming of uh, dendritic and T cells, for example. And um, this was actually a, a, a review that uh, Isaac Chu, who was a postdoc in my lab at the time, wrote where we hypothesized that this may be true. And indeed, it has turned out to be so. And Isaac then went on to uh, conduct a study showing that bacteria directly activate sensory neurons. And that activation by virtue of the release of neuropeptides uh, modulates inflammation. We then went on to study whether activation of, of, of nociceptors by themselves was sufficient to drive inflammation. And this was a collaboration with Stephanie Lacour's lab at EPFL. Uh, Fred Michaud, who was a graduate student at EPFL, spent half of his time in my lab. And he, he showed that optogenetic activation selectively of nociceptors was sufficient to produce inflammation by virtue of the, the Uh, affected by the sensory nervous system, but the adaptive immune system was as well. And she showed that IgE class, which uh, in B cells uh, can be triggered by uh, the release of neuropeptides uh, acting on, on, on B cells. So based on this, we have begun to look at a com comprehensive neuroimmune interactome. And a postdoc in my lab, uh, Akansha and Jane, has been uh, driving this. Uh, looking to see all the potential uh, ligands that can be produced by immune cells that can potentially act on all the receptors and ion channels that are expressed by sensory neurons in peripheral tissue. And this work is, uh, has uh, a preprint of this work is now available on bioarchive, um, and uh, we hope to get uh, a full paper published sometime this year. What uh, Akansha did was to look at three models of peripheral inflammation, skin incision as a model of surgical injury, UV burn, and a zymosin injection as a model of pathogen invasion. She then characterized uh, all the immune cells I in the skin in, in these three inflammatory conditions and showed that they were actually surprisingly quite different. So that uh, for a long time, many pain biologists con considered inflammation to be a single entity, inflammatory pain, but in fact, it's almost certainly going to be much more complicated. What she has also identified is that the interaction that occurs in healthy conditions with the absence of inflammation, not surprisingly, is quite different from the disease interaction. So um, what we now need to appreciate is that there is a bidirectional communication between sensory neurons, which release neuropeptides and other ligands that can act on immune cells, and that the immune cells themselves directly make ligands or have enzymes that produce uh, ligands that can act on the sensory neurons. And this contributes to a number of disease states, such as uh, pain where associated with trauma, uh, infections, and autoimmune disorders, as well as itch, because the, pr the prurie receptors which trigger itch also have receptors for immune ligands. Interestingly, there was a paper that was reported earlier this year in Nature Immunology but by Tanaka et al. And um, a, one of my graduate students, uh, Sarah Hakim, and I wrote a little perspective on that, also in Nature Immunology, which showed that even in healthy, non-inflamed conditions, there is a tonic uh, release of NGF from macrophages, which acts on the sensory neurons and help set their uh, responsiveness. So in addition to targeting the uh, immune uh, cell release of ligands that act on uh, neurons, we can also target the effect, the impact of uh, ligands released from the neurons that act on the immune cells. And we and others have shown that this contributes to a number of disease states, such as allergic asthma, atopic dermatitis, contact hypersensitivity, and in the case of uh, uh, food allergy, uh, the sensory neurons and the gastrointestinal type. A former postdoc of mine, Sebastian Talbot, who is now at Queen's University and at the Karolinska Institute, um, 
was looking at the way in which sensory neurons may contribute to pain and itch in cancer conditions. And And uh, essentially, we need to add this now to our perspective of neuromean interactions that sensory neurons innovating cancer uh, are a driver of the growth of, uh, of, uh, of, of these cancers, and that reducing the sensory innovation and the release of neuropeptides will reduce, uh, contribute to uh, a, a strategy for reducing cancer growth. So, how, how to try and uh, utilize these, this new insight that there is immune neuro in, uh, interactions, neuroimmune interactions. Well, working with uh, Bruce Bean, who's a, an electrophysiologist at Harvard Medical School, we came up with a strategy by which we could selectively block the activity of nociceptors using charged sodium channel blockers, which are too large to uh, enter this, uh, uh, the uh, cells directly through the membrane, but can enter the cells through large pore ion channels such as TRIP-B1, TRIP-A1 and others, which are only expressed in nociceptors. So uh, this is a technique that only works in activated nociceptors, allows these charged sodium channel blockers into the cell and then blocks the sodium channels, silencing nociceptors. And this is a strategy that can now be used to treat a number of uh, 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 immune uh, conditions that are primed and driven by nociceptors. So essentially, the conclusion really is that we need to stop seeing the nervous system and the immune si system as separate entities because they function together, interact together, and uh, that contributes both to homeostatic aspects of their function, but also to disease states. Thank you very much. Ha happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you so much for this presentation. I think that was quite interesting and brought very well the point of it's not two entities, it's basically one. And although we are running a bit short of time, I think it would be very interesting also for you to share your opinion on what do you think, why would biology evolve something like a nervous system and immune system and then have this very close interaction where at some point it becomes almost indistinguishable, right? It flows into each other. What is your take on basically the evolution of this? Well, I think if you even look at single cell organisms, uh, they too need to detect danger. And that this has been a fundamental aspect of, of, of life, that the world we live in is dangerous and we need to be able to detect it and avoid it. And uh, as multicellular organisms began to form, it so happened that there were two ways of doing that through the immune system, the nervous system, we artificially saw them as separate, but in fact, they are together and they work together and they are activated together and interact together. And I just think we now need to uh, uh, appreciate that and that evolution didn't see them as separate. It, it, uh, uh, it, it drove them to, to, to have these lines of communication in both directions. Interesting, interesting. And I think our uh, research is backing this up, right? You've shown, I mean, your studies, but also the one about um, cancer immunology. And uh, we got maybe time for, for the question. The cheddar recently learned that immune pathways leading to allodynia are different in males and females, if you might want to comment on this. Sorry, I, I, uh, you, you, I lost you for a few minutes. I, I didn't hear your question. I'm sorry. Um, there, there's this comment that there might be some differences in males and females regarding allodynia. Do you want to comment on this maybe? Well, uh, there, there are many gender differences and in, indeed uh, one of the more exciting aspects of this relate to microglia, not to what I've been talking about there, that when you have nerve injury that causes microglial activation in the spinal cord, and that turns out to be present in males and not females. Uh, so yes, there are gender differences and we need to begin to explore what that means and why that has occurred. But it is gonna be part of the, the issue. So thanks for bringing that up. Thank you very much. And yes, I think this is an exciting field, right? Because interdisciplinary doesn't only mean neuro and immunology, uh, but it also means if it's bioinformatics, if it genders, if it is 
whatever we have been, so to say, been artificially separating, as Dr. Wolf said. And we also know that um, in um, rodents, there might be different mechanisms than in humans, right? So there's lots of things to discover. But now I would again pass it on to Michaela for our next talk given by, by Dr. Fulan. Thank you, Patrick. And our next speaker is uh, Dr. Roberta Perlan, who is the director of the Institute of Experimental Neuro Neurology in Ospedale San Raffaele in Milan, Italy. So Dr. Perlan, uh, he has published over 2,000, uh, 200, sorry, very good articles on, uh, in various international journals. Uh, on the topics of autoimmune encephalomyelitis, MS, and its immunogenic therapy, and myeloid microvesicles, to, uh, to name the few. Uh, Dr. Roberto, thank you for taking the time in your busy schedule, and uh, you may begin your presentation. Thank you very much. I'm still fascinated by the talk uh, by Professor Wolf. I, I... I, I think there is, as he was saying, a lot to discover, and I'm sure, uh, uh, as he was saying, that it's not, uh, they're not separate entities. They're talking the same language, and we still have to uh, decode uh, uh, this dialogue. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. So I'm sharing my screen, and here is my presentation. Okay. Don. Okay, so um, yes, there are many ways to be interdisciplinary and maybe uh, shuttling back and forth from uh, 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 the clinic is one of the opportunities to mix different uh, uh, aspects. Uh, I, I was trained as a, as a medical doctor, but I wanted to do uh, research. So uh, after medical school, I first had a PhD in cell biology and only later I I made a residency in neurology. So uh, uh, I think I have had many opportunities to make this shuttling back and forth. And I'm taking here two examples. I start uh, very, uh, uh, I would say, I don't know, maybe uh, uh, even audaciously with uh, no introduction, throwing you directly into uh, uh, the first uh, uh, piece of evidence that was produced by a resident of neurology in my lab. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to make the introduction in words rather than uh, with the data that you're looking at. Um, this guy was, was very interested in the fact that by interfering in the, with the PD-1 PDL uh, pathway, which is very well known, there has been a Nobel Prize awarded for describing this pathway. This is a checkpoint inhibitor for immune reactions. And uh, if, if there is this interaction, uh, uh, immune reactions, let's say, are inhibited, and this is a way tumors use to make immune escape. So interfering with this pathway uh, uh, has been a fantastic opportunity to treat cancer in a new way and uh, certainly has saved uh, uh, many, many lives. On the other uh, hand, it also has produced uh, side effects. And some of these side effects are uh, characterized by neuroinflammation. So this resident who was Tommaso Croese, he's now at the Weizmann Institute in Rehovot in Israel. Uh, he was uh, 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 interested in looking at this pathway in neuroinflammation. And he simply uh, uh, took some blood and uh, made a flow cytometry assay. I'm not going to describe the details looking at PD-1 and there are two ligands, PD-L1 and PD-L2. PD-L1 is very much studied, PD-L2 is a little bit more neglected, but applying these unbiased uh, analysis uh, that are now possible, uh, that, that, that don't rely on what you know before on your uh, subpopulations in the immune system, he find out, found out that uh, uh, PD-L2, so the less uh, 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 studied ligand was overexpressed on neutrophil, neutrophils. And this was really serendipity because to see neutrophils, you need to do the staining on fresh blood, which we usually don't do. 
and without separating mononuclear cells, which is the usual way uh, we do, uh, because we are mostly interested in uh, mononuclear cells, as, at least in my lab. And so uh, we, 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 we came up with a population that was undescribed uh, before. Uh, clearly, uh, what Tommaso did immediately was to try to characterize it from his point of view, which is uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, the, the, the levels of these PDL2 positive neutrophils in, uh, in, uh, in people with uh, multiple sclerosis, so with a prototypical neuroinflammatory disease uh, that he was uh, studying. And he found that uh, in, in a very clean, way, an increased level of these neutrophils um, is associated uh, uh, with disease activity. Uh, autoimmune diseases, all of autoimmune diseases have uh, recurrences and then remission phases. And this is true also for the initial phases of uh, multiple sclerosis. So especially inflammatory phases of the disease were characterized by the increase of this uh, uh, this kind of neutrophils. Clearly, neutrophils that express PDL2, which means a checkpoint, uh, 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 an immune checkpoint, uh, means or suggests at least that these neutrophils may be regulatory neutrophils, immune suppressive neutrophils, neutrophils that are there uh, for an homeostatic reason to try to control uh, the excess of inflammation. But how to uh, demonstrate this? it's extremely difficult uh, in, in vitro because neutrophils are short-lived and uh, extremely difficult to uh, uh, cultivate because they immediately activate, extremely fragile. So Susanna Manenti in my lab, she was doing a PhD to cover this, this project. And uh, uh, in, with great difficulty, she tried to set up uh, 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 immune assays in vitro to trying to demonstrate this by co-cultivating uh, these neutrophils. So comparing PDL2 and PDL negative neutrophils, co-cultivation with T cells, she was able to show that uh, uh, indeed these neutrophils uh, are uh, able to decrease at least the proliferation rate and also to demonstrate that at least part of this effect is due to uh, uh, the interaction of neutrophils directly with T cells through uh, the PDL and, and through the PD1, PD1, because by masking the PD1 with an anti PD1 antibody that uh, 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 blocks the possibility for PDL2 to interact, indeed, there was some rescue, as you can see here or here, uh, uh, of this uh, suppressive uh, effect. And uh, uh, we also show uh, that uh, uh, T cells indeed in vitro physically interact, as you can see here in, uh, in uh, cyano or violet, I don't know, uh, uh, are T cells characterized by the expression of CD3, while neutrophils characterized by the expression of CD16 is magenta, and, and you can see they interact. They are not done. We, we, we find out that although many people uh, many scientists had proposed before the direct interaction between neutrophils and T cells. Uh, there have not so many. There are not so many pictures in the in the literature available, and we noticed that there is a roughly one to three ratio uh, uh, all the time for this kind of uh, interaction. Still, in my mind, this still is a very weak indication that uh, uh, um, these uh, uh, neutrophils are indeed immune suppressive. So we had to go from the clinic to the in vitro, now to the preclinical model. Uh, with the help of uh, scientists around the world, we found the available uh, 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 genetic models to play with. So we have a, a mouse here that has a Cree deleter. I hope you know uh, how the, the Cree lock system works. Uh, uh, Cree is an enzyme that is able to recombine the DNA and take out a piece uh, uh, of, the, of DNA at will, uh, uh, characterized by these uh, LOX uh, uh, sequences uh, uh, that mark uh, 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 the piece of DNA, that flank the piece of DNA, the chunk of DNA to be 
to be deleted. And, and, and using uh, this system, we were able to set up a mouse model where specifically in PDL2 positive uh, myeloid cells, including neutrophils, uh, there was the expression of the diphtheria toxin receptor so that in any given moment uh, uh, of the disease, we could take out these cells by administering diphtheria, diphtheria toxin. And uh, by doing so, uh, we uh, immunized these mice to produce the prototypical, more classical, most, most used model of neuroinflammation. I wouldn't say MS because it's very different from MS, but still it's a very useful model for neuroinflammation, which is uh, uh, experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis. Uh, we were able to show that by depleting these PDL2 positive neutrophils, indeed, as you can see here from the Kaplan Meier curve, uh, uh, the depleted mice all are sick by day 15 after the immunization. And uh, while, while controls still have to get sick, they will get sick, all of them, later. Uh, uh, but uh, especially the disease is much, is much more severe. We made all types of controls. Uh, we also made gender medicine here because the uh, phenomenon is more <laughs> evident in female mice than in uh, uh, male mice. But clearly, this is uh, uh, now a, a, a very complex and uh, long work uh, uh, that we are submitting right this day because this was a, a opens up the possibility to think about uh, 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 enforcing uh, uh, this kind of uh, 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 cells with a, a suppressive uh, a phenotype. We also learned how to induce them. They are easily induced in humans through the administration of IL-4 uh, um, as a possible uh, also therapeutic intervention in humans. Uh, this is uh, the pathology by, done by Roberta Magliozzi in Verona. Uh, she is a strict collaborator of the UK Brain Bank uh, in London and uh, has access to lots of tissues uh, of MS patients, of multiple sclerosis patients, and she has shown these cells are there also in the meninges of, uh, of human uh, subjects with multiple sclerosis. So uh, this was my story from, uh, 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 let's say, the, 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 the clinics back uh, to the bench, and I will be very short uh, uh, showing you the other way around, to, along with uh, Diego Centonze, who is... Uh, an electrophysiologist, a neurologist, and also a psychiatrist. Uh, we showed uh, some years ago, so many years ago, I would say in 2009 with this Journal of Neuroscience paper, that uh, uh, indeed in EIE, so the same model I've shown you before, there are synaptic alterations induced by uh, inflammation. Certainly not uh, uh, the most uh, original paper of this type. Uh, there had been many descriptions before of cytokines, uh, 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 modulating synapses, above all, I would say the 2004 paper by Bob Malenka on TNF alpha and uh, uh, and uh, but from there, Diego Centonze went back to the clinic. He's also running an MS center and uh, made lots and uh, uh, of studies uh, associating uh, uh, synaptic plasticity uh, and uh, uh, the level of cytokines in the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, producing a lot of knowledge uh, and a lot of clinical validation of what was discovered over the years uh, by, by many scientists, including Volterra and many others, on the effects of uh, especially primary inflammatory cytokines on the synaptic activity, and trying to dissect also their clinical uh, 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 consequences. What we did was to try uh, and to start to collaborate with psychiatrists and uh, we have been doing, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, at, the, at the time uh, we started this kind of uh, uh, scientific activity, research activity, this was absolutely simply associative science. So we had this large uh, uh, sample set uh, of, uh, especially uh, uh, in this case is uh, acute uh, psychosis. Uh, that includes uh, schizophrenia, but it includes also the onset of uh, uh, bipolar, uh, 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 bipolar disease. And we have shown clearly 
that there is in a subset of patients a very distinct uh, uh, immune signature and that this is present at the very beginning and it's not an epiphenomenon driven by, I don't know, behavioral uh, uh, changes, uh, uh, hygienic uh, changes in, in, in these subjects. Uh, we have taken this to a, a, a much higher level of refinement with uh, Francesco Benedetti, which is a psychiatrist that has worked a lot on bio biological psychiatry and uh, uh, up to showing that, for example, NK cells, natural killer cells, are even protective in bipolar patients on, on, on white matter disruption, which is typical of, of these subjects. Uh, the most extreme consequence is that we open it up uh, in these days, uh, the blind of uh, a clinical uh, uh, trial that we made with immunomodulants in uh, acute depression, both in for uh, major depression and bipolar depression. And we found astonishing positive results using the immunomodulant as an add-on. So providing standard therapy and using this as an add-on. And of course, we are running to write the paper. This is my last scientific slide. I wanted just to, since this is a young audience, uh, share uh, some of the best uh, Italian street artists. And I thank you for your attention. I have a very happy uh, group. We were talking about gastronomy. This is our favorite restaurant in Milano. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, since we started a bit late, we don't have too much time, but to ask maybe a more general question, which could still be uh, quite interesting is, what do you think at the moment are the biggest so to say challenges for connecting the basic research with clinical applications and or clinical research? Well, the first thing is that, uh, and this is an international phenomenon, physician scientists are disappearing. So <laughs> as the director of, of the Institute for Experimental Neurology, I'm trying to protect uh, uh, this, this kind of uh, 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 professional figure in a, in a in, in, a, in, in this bamboo wood where we protect the, pa the giant pandas <laughs> because there are so few uh, physicians right now that they are all attracted by very good salaries if they do purely clinician, clinical work. And it's very difficult to keep them doing research work. Uh, but this is not the only way. There is a physical distance. There are very few research hospitals that offer uh, critical mass and... Uh, and uh, especially basic science fa facilities. I don't believe very much in the label translational science. I think good science, even if it's uh, very basic science can be translated very fast, as long as there are brilliant scientists and the possibility for connections. And physical vicinity is one of the uh, issues. You, you really, the big university hospital, the big research hospital really need to have to be contiguous because the people has to interact, to talk, and uh, to, to, to spark uh, uh, the, the contact that, that, that needs uh, for, for fast uh, translation. Uh, I think these are two of the many uh, uh, crucial issues. All right. That is quite interesting. That is quite interesting. And especially something that is not obvious at all, I would say, especially to us younger researchers. So thank you very much for your presentation, for the insights. Uh, I know. I again pass on to Michaela and, and Dr. Rojas. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you again, Dr. Roberta. And for our final short talk, uh, we introduce Dr. Olga Rojas, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Immunology at the University of Toronto. Her work is focused on gut brain axis, by which the intestinal microbiota can impact the aging of the brain. Uh, Dr. Roll has very fascinating research, and we are very excited to hear more. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and I'm hoping that you will um, enjoy the, the, my talk. I'm, I'm happy because Dr. Forlan and Dr. Worf uh, did a good job at introducing a few um, concepts uh, for me. Um, so I will try to put the, all the things together with... Uh, what they presented. Mm, so let's start. Um, my, my main interest is um, trying to understand 
uh, the gut brain access and the role of intestinal B cells in neuroinflammation. So again, we are going back to the point that Dr. Wolf mentioned um, about thinking as a whole phenomenon um, in our body. It's not only neurons here or brain here and gut in the other side, it's, it's something that is all connected and that's what we are trying to understand. Did my slide uh, switch? Or no, no, we can steal all of them. I think. Uh... Uh, hold on a second. It's just that I know that I had a few issues. Um, um, you can share your entire screen if you like. Then it certainly works. And you yeah, see there we now. Go. Yes. Perfect. And if I switch to my next one, it is also. changing. Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. Okay, it's just that this week I had an issue before, so that's what I am checking. Okay, so first I want to introduce you to three main concepts that we are going to discuss today. This is just the basics to understand, but I will present you after um, because maybe some people here is familiar with the immune cells. Some other people here are more familiar with the chemistry and the biochemistry. So let's try to put this together. The first, com first component is the immune system. So there are two basic uh, progenitors of um, the immune cells. Um, and in red, I highlight, uh, highlighted the ones that are mainly my main focus. Um, so the lymphoid stem cells will um, give origin to mainly the B cells as well as the T cells. And as I mentioned in my title, I'm, I'm basically interested on B cells, which are down here. And you will see through the talk that there are different flavors of B cells, and we will try to touch up um, onto all of them. Um, so all the B cells are generated in the bone marrow. Um, they leave the bone marrow basically as immature B cells. Um, they finalize their maturation, then they find the antigen and they become activated B cells. Um, they go to the germinal centers um, and some of those B cells can egress as either memory B cells or plasma cells. Um, and there are different subsets of plasma cells. Um, their main role so far is actively secreting immunoglobulins. Um, but uh, it is also known that there is a specific sub subset of plasma cells that live for years. In fact, there are beautiful papers um, showing how there are long-lived plasma cells that are present in either the bone marrow or the gut um, that can be there for 30, 40 years or even more in humans, which is amazing. Whereas there are some other plasma cells that die quickly. And um, in the middle, we also have some memory B cells that are trying to replenish um, the um, small um, short leaf and long leaf uh, plasma cell compartments, compartments over time. So this is pretty much the entire picture of um, what is a B cell in just one slide. Um, now let's talk about our second component, um, which is the gut. Um, this is just um, um, an image of what we have inside the gut. So we imagine the gut is a tube and we have inside the gut in the lumen, we have these little fingers that are um, going towards the lumen. Um, it's a really long, long surface. And um, those dendrites are called villi. And this is the magnification of an image of a villi. Uh, we have a layer of um, epithelial cells here. Um, in the lumen, we have the bacteria that live with, with us, with, which we call a microbiome. It's not only bacteria, there are also uh, uh, parasites and um, protozoas, but uh, um, we are mainly focusing for now on the microbiome bacteria. But one thing that is interesting is that um, underneath the epithelial layer in the lamina propria, which is like the gray color underneath that we have here, I am showing you in green, um, how we have neurons um, that are connected in the gut with all that uh, microenvironment. Uh, we have the circulation and we also have immune cells. So even from the small organ standpoint, we can see how everything, neurons, immune cells, epithelial cells are all connected. Now, we know that there are different abundance of bacteria in the intestinal lumen. Um, sometimes some um, decrease, sometimes some increase. 
and they are linked with damage or protection against inflammation through mainly different metabolites. In the last few years, there has been a lot of papers showing how um, some metabolites, especially short chain fatty acids, can maybe sometimes increase or decrease the inflammation um, in the gut. And we are trying to understand how they are related with the brain. And that's why we have this image here where you can see the brain. And this is just a representation of what we have in the gut. Uh, we have the bacteria as well as the B cells and the um, immune cells overall. They are producing cytokines. But the other thing that we have to keep in mind, and Dr. Wolf was able to mention um, a little bit about this, is the fact that we have neurotransmitters. And these neurotransmitters can impact both the immune cells, but they can also travel back to the brain and impact um, the what is happening in the brain. So that's by the end how they are connected. One of the important nerves that um, uh, connect both the uh, brain with the gut is the vagus nerve. Um, and then the last component is a multiple sclerosis. Um, as um, you maybe will know, um, it's um, progressive clinical disability. Uh, it changes a lot through um, the years. Um, and there are different types of um, multiple sclerosis. But overall, we use the MRI gadolinium enhancing um, imaging to track for lesions. Um, these white plaques here are mainly the lesions where we can see demyelination in the brain in uh, patients with MS. Um, that is one of the uh, most important hallmarks to track um, the disease and the outcome of the disease as well as the progression. Um, over time, the patients um, develop um, a progression of clinical disability. Um, during the latest years of the disease, um, you can see how the um, stages of the disease progress um, sometimes really aggressively. And the other thing that is interesting is that um, um, over time, the size or the volume of the brain also decreases as um, it is represented here. Um, so the overall um, theory, um, um, if you think about what is happening or what is happening in terms of the immune cells to damage the myelin in the brain is that um, the T cells are activated um, in the um, peripheral tissues, then they go through the circulation, um, they cross the BBB and then they go into the brain. In the brain, those T cells get reactivated with the myelin and they produce cytokines. And that attracts even more cells, including B cells. And then the B cells produce antibodies um, against the myelin. And that's how the myelin um, on the neurons gets destroyed. And the patients develop symptoms and um, clinical progression. Now, it has been thought for years that the T cells um, were the key drivers or are the key drivers of neuroinflammation. But then we ask, what, we, what is happening with the B cells and what is the role that the B cells are playing, playing in the disease? Now, we know that uh, we can find B cells in MS and they might, I'm suggesting that they may be, play an important role. Uh, one of the first, first things that it's important is that the, you can find antibodies, oligoclonal bands of antibodies in the cerebrospinal fluid. Um, uh, as you can see all the bars, the bars here coming from an MS patient. And um, also if you check in the brain of post-mortem post MS patients, um, as it, it is shown here, we can see how um, we can see clusters of CD20 cells, meaning B cells, that are mainly around the um, vasculature, and sometimes you can also find them around um, the lesions in the brain. So that was telling us that the, the although the T cells were the main drivers of the disease, the B cells were also found in the tissue um, in um, MS progression, and maybe they were also playing a role. So there were a few groups back um, in 2010 where people were asking what will happen if we deplete B cells. Um, and the pharmaceutical companies were able to develop um, different, a few um, um, chimeric antibodies to deplete B cells. And they run um, clinical trials with those um, antibodies. One of them um, is known as ocrelusimab. Um, and they were able to show that 
uh, once the patients start started using um, ocrelusimab, the number of lesions decrease over time compared with the placebo group or the group that was receiving um, interferon beta in green, meaning that by depleting B cells, we were able um, to help patients to get um, to not to develop more um, lesions in the brain. But what was interesting during the, those clinical trials is that the antibodies didn't disappear in the cerebral spinal fluid. And there were a few papers showing how even um, we were able to deplete B cells um, in, the, in, in the overall compartments, um, the intestinal IgA uh, plasma cells uh, were not abrogated after the B cell depletion treatment. Um, after these clinical trials, in, in fact, the ocrelusimab treatment is one of the hallmark, hallmark treatments right now to treat um, MS patients. So that gives us the sense that the B cells were important for the progression of the disease. Then the, the, act, the question that maybe we can ask is, can we do better? Is there anything else that we can improve? What if we deplete plasma cells? So another pharmaceutical company tested um, a drug that is called atacicep that um, depletes both B cells and uh, plasma cells. Um, and you can see in blue, green, and red, the different concentrations of the atacicep. Uh, compared with placebo in purple. And as you can see, the patients that were receiving um, the treatment with atacicep were doing worse because they were developing a worse um, um, incidence of new uh, lesions. Um, meaning that by depleting B cells, um, specifically plasma cells, the patients were, were doing worse. Um, so we decided to take up one step back and go to the um, EAE mice model as a model of neuroinflammation to investigate the role of B cells in MS. Basically, what we do is um, we inject the mice with MOC35, 55 and pertussis, and then we track the score of the mice. Um, this is what is happening over time, up to the point that they are almost totally paralyzed. And um, just because of the way we are doing this immunization, the mice can recover a little bit. But this was the main um, um, immunization that we were doing. And we were trying to track the B cells. Um, we had um, a few um, animal strains that uh, we used to track all the different B cells. So we have CD19 to track pretty much all the B cells. Uh, BLIMP1 um, conditional reporters are helping us to track plasma cells in particular. We can also track IID activation, uh, representing class switch recombination on those B cells. and. Um, most of the experiments that I am going to show you are coming from this strain of mice, which is a plasma cell deficient mouse where they are healthy, normal, but they lack plasma cells in all the body. Um, so once we induce um, EAE in wild type, in overall wild types, our first question was like, let's see if we can find B cells in the brain. And as you can see here, we found um, we track the plasma cells with the expression of the PRDM1. Um, we find them in both the brain and the spinal cord, and we were able to find that some of them were um, secreting IgA and some were secreting IgG. Uh, we confirm this by an elispot assay, where you can see actively a cell secreting the immunoglobulin in a plate. Um, and you can see how, um, surprisingly, um, there are IgA as well as IgG antibody secreting cells in both the brain and the spinal cord during the chronic phase of the EAE in black six mice. So then um, our question was, um, what are those IgA plasma cells doing in the CNS? My initial background is mucosal immunology. Um, so I thought, oh, well, most of the IgA plasma cells are in the gut. So why don't we explore what is happening in the gut? And that's why we decided to check um, the intestine in those mice. Uh, we check for the small intestine. And surprisingly, uh, we have um, on the left side the unimmunized mice, and then on the right side, we have the immunized mice. And you can see how the signal for the plasma cells dramatically decrease in EAE mice. Um, so we decided to quantify and confirm that the plasma cells were decreasing in the gut. Um, you can also see how the layer the epithelial layer in the gut is a little bit more disruptive. It's like kind of damage. Um, so we were thinking, okay, 
what is happening in the gut and how the gut is connected with um, those IgA plasma cells that we can find in the brain during EAE. Uh, one of the first things that we did is um, we um, run the EAE in the mice that were lacking um, IgA plasma cells. And when we induce EAE in the mice that had no plasma cells, as you can see here in dark blue, those mice were doing worse than the mice uh, with a full compartment of B cells. Um, we confirmed that with the also with the conditional for AID. Um, so then, by then, there were more papers coming out about a possible role of IgA plasma cells as immunosuppressive. Um, so we thought maybe the IgA plasma cells from the gut are important to control the inflammation in the gut and to ask if the gut-derived IgA plasma cells really can impact the outcome of the EAE, we decided to induce the EAE in the plasma cell deficient mice and then transfer IgA plasma cells that were isolated from the gut. And as you can see here, um, Remember, when we induce EAE initially in the plasma cell deficient mice, they develop a really severe disease. But when we inject the IgA plasma cells um, um, derived from the gut into those mice, um, those plasma cell deficient mice do better in terms of the cumulative score for EAE, meaning that the IgA plasma cells were derived from the gut were doing something in the um, brain. Um, I'm not going to show you um, a few other results here, but uh, we were able to confirm that those IgA plasma cells that were initially primed in the gut were able to migrate into the brain by doing some CAIDA experiments. Uh, but one of the key things that helped us to realize that the IgA plasma cells were migrating from the gut is this um, Ellis assay. We coated the plate with microbiome bacteria derived from the gut, and then we played um, B cells, um, in our case, from the brain um, on uh, after EAE. Um, and that will help us to detect cells like these ones. These pink spots are um, IgA plasma cells that are recognized in the microbiome, and they were located or isolated from the gut. Um, so we know that some of the IgA plasma cells that were prime against the microbiome in the gut can migrate into the brain. Um, and later on, we were able to show that um, it was mainly dependent on IL-10. Um, some of those intestinal IgA plasma cells that were traveling into the brain were producing IL-10, and that was helping um, to decrease the inflammation. So... We were able to show that them, there were so, an important subset of IgA plasma cells that were migrating from the gut to the brain to attenuate the, um, the inflammation during EAE, and it was in an IL-10 dependent matter. So overall, our um, hypothesis, uh, our model was that the IgA plasma cells were initially primed in the um, gut. They um, some some of them can stay in the bone marrow and during um, um, inflammation in the brain, they can migrate into the brain. They produce IL-10 and they help to control the inflammation there. Um, in addition to that, we have to consider the fact that the gut microbiome, um, it's, it's variable. We have to consider that there are uh, metabolites as well as other immune cells that can also uh, play a role and can impact the outcome in the brain. So we are trying to rule out different things um, and put them together as a whole um, in terms of our, mo our model to better understand what is happening. Um, after our paper, there were beautiful papers showing, and I just want to highlight these ones because I think they are super key. Um, uh, Dr. Cladworthy was able to show that there were um, gut educated IgA plasma cells in the meningeal area, mainly in the dura mater, in both mice and humans, even under a steady state. So they are lying there for a reason that we still don't totally know. And then Marco Conona and um, Jonathan Kipnis were also able to confirm that in the meningeal compartment, we can find a good amount of B cells that accumulate there and maybe do some kind of surveillance and control for um, inflammation there. But there are tons of things that we are still missing and we don't understand their mechanisms in terms of why the B cells are going there, what are they doing there? This is just a picture of what we are starting doing in the lab. Uh, we are starting to dissect uh, the dura matter from the school. 
of the mice um, during EAE and also during um, neurogenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease, mice models. And then we are trying to understand what is happening with the B cells in acute and chronic stages, how they change, how they get there, why do they get there, and which are the possible mechanisms for that. Um, so with that, I'm going to finish. I want to thank everyone in the lab. Um, my lab is small. I'm um, a new PI recently. Um, most of the work that I, I show you uh, is part of my postdoc uh, work. Um, in collaboration with my previous mentor, Dr. Gomerman, and in collaboration with and AK Probostel as well as Sergio Barancini. Um, and now we are trying to understand all the mechanisms um, that are related with those and IgA intestinal plasma cells, as well as trying to translate that knowledge into um, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, so with that, I will finish and I will thank everyone for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Hojas. It was quite interesting and we're a bit over time, but I still really want to ask a question which we have discussed a little bit. You've shown such a nice connection between the gut and the brain, basically involving the bone marrow. How is your take on the idea that basically there might be other organs playing a role for these, let's say, systemic diseases, which still they maybe just become obvious or very strong within one organ at the end? Yeah, well, I said since the beginning, and I believe that uh, of thinking um, of the immune, cells, immune system as a whole, right? So uh, if I can't ask where the opposite now. Um, I do think that there are other organs involved. Uh, one of the things that we have been doing recently is we are applying the same microbiome spot to see if we can detect microbiome IJ plasma cells in other tissues. And it's interesting because there are, some tissues where we can find them and some where we cannot find them. Like for example, the liver, there is a good number of them um, as well is, as in the adipo, adipose tissue and the lungs. Um, so that is telling us that somehow the mucosal compartment is related with some other organs. Uh, we know that people is also talking now about the gut liver axis, for example. So they are connected, it's just that we are just starting to see the tip of the iceberg. And we stay excited for, for what else is coming, so to say. And with yes. that, thank you again so much for your talk. Thanks all of you basically for your talks. And now we want to move on to a bit more interactive format where we uh, discuss something. So Michaela will introduce our three panelists and we will have a little discussion here about um, challenges, about opportunities, about benefits of actually working in a field that is interdisciplinary at the end. And so, Michaela, if you want to introduce our speakers, who are also very welcome to all uh, activate their camera, join us here, so to say, on the stage uh, to, to get the discussion going. Uh, right. Uh, like you said, Patrick, we're off to our uh, round table discussion. And we will, we will discuss the benefits and challenges of interdisciplinary research from our diverse of our experts, Dr. Dabrowski, Dr. Dank, and Dr. McNeaton. And you, so Yvonne Dabrowski is a senior lecturer at School of Medicine, Dentistry, and Biomedical Sciences. Her, uh, her research team is focused on the immune mechanism and tissue damage and repair. Uh, Dr. Francisca Denk is, a, is the head of the Denk Laboratory, which is particularly interested in why pain persists uh, over the long periods of time, and it's exploring the role of neuroimmune inter inter interactions and ep epigenetic mechanisms. And finally, Dr. Peter Nathan is a professor of pharmacology at King's College London, he investigates the cellular and molecular basis of pain, uh, term organizations, and term regulations. Also, he recently began working on how immune cells, such as neutrophils, uh, detect and locate, uh, locate the bacterial targets. Welcome all, and I leave you in trust the hands of Patrick and our speakers. Exactly, and we just saw that you somehow can turn on your videos, right? You guys, so you no, can unmute yourself. So, yeah. We can talk. The cameras won't start. 
Yeah, that's a bit strange. I mean, I could make you a host. Let's see. And when I'm going to make you, a, I hope this is going to be that you're going to be a co-host. Now you should be able to turn on your video, no? Yes, it's working now. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Bye, everyone. Hey there. And if you could now also make uh, uh, Francisca and Peter a host, maybe then it should also be possible for them to turn on their video. Just, uh, you know how to do this? Are you talking to me? Yes, I'm talking <laughs> to you. So you have to um, go to like to the panels where you see, for example, Francisca Dank. And if you go to her name, there's like this little blue box with the three dots popping up. And if you okay. click on this, you can make her a host as well. We have to unfortunately do this procedure for the Zoom. Yes, and now Francisca can also turn on Francisca, her video. Can you do it? Yes, perfect. Yes, and, and now, now you, you, Francisca, have to do it for the next one. Yeah, yeah, now you have to do it for Peter. Well. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Uh, let's see, Peter. Exactly. Okay, now you can turn on. now. <laughs> yes, there we go. Hi, here we are. Hello. <laughs> very good. Very good, you guys. So we're going to start a little discussion, and of course. Everybody's interested in your opinion and experiences. And so uh, I have some seed questions, of course. I will always be here, but I will always uh, try to remain as silent as possible so that you can start on and keep on the discussion amongst you. Um, maybe to, to just start it off, of course, everybody within the chat can write their questions into the chat. You can also raise your hand and we can unmute you if you want to do this at any point. And I thought the nice introduction might be. Uh, to, to start with Yvonne, if you could maybe give a little uh, background because you actually have made all of this experience as going from one field, trying to merge it with the other. Um, what is your background? And then maybe what do you think was the biggest challenge for you to actually go this way? Yeah, so um, actually my background is in immunology and um, I started off in a completely different field, tumor immunology. I did my PhD in tumor immunology in Germany. And then for my postdoc, I changed field again, stayed in immunology, but went into skin innate immunity and autoimmune disease. Um, and because I did all my training in Germany at that point, I decided I need some international exposure. Um, and I felt, you know, I was very naive. I felt, okay, you know, just uh, apply for some very interesting postdoc positions elsewhere. And I ended up at Queen's University Belfast in the field of neuroimmunology. And that's been quite a while now, 10 years. Um, so again, immunology is the common theme in my career, but neuroimmunology, something completely different. I had no clue what it was about. And I just thought, okay, interesting. Um, let's see how it goes. Uh, went very well, <laughs> still very happy in that field. Um, but yeah, there, there had been challenges. So advantages from my side, and I can only talk about my personal experience is working interdisciplinary is um, really rewarding. And you feel like a little bit coming off site. You bring some new perspectives uh, into the new field, um, especially if, if you have an immunology background working um, in a different area, for, for example, tumor biology initially for me, then skin innate immunity, and now neuroimmunology. I had to learn, obviously, all the new things and the new fields. Um, even the language was different. Um, if you come from an immunology background, you talk different than um, if you were to come from a pure neuroscience background. So you have to learn the language and obviously all the literature, lots of catch up to do, but it's also super exciting. And you do bring some own new ideas from your previous training, which I found particularly interesting. And it helped me a lot. Um, particularly starting then my own group a few years back and um, yeah, staying in the field of neuroimmunology. So I feel still having this interdisciplinary and quite broad background in immunology still does help me now um, in my neuroimmunology research. Talking about learning a new language, uh, maybe maybe focus just briefly on this again, like, uh, of course, uh, for, for people, what do you mean? And then what maybe helped you as well to, to get along with all this new vocabulary? Yeah, so if we think, so one thing that comes to my mind is if immunologists talk about periphery, they're talking obviously about you know, blood circulation, they're talking about peripheral organs such as the spleen, and then they're talking about um, more central organs, which would be the bone marrow, or potentially the thymus. And if neuroscientists scientists talk about that, um, this is more the brain. So um, it's just something that that I was 
finding initially a bit, oh, okay, we're talking about the prey now, periphery, okay, that's a peripheral nervous system, nothing to do with the, with the, um, with the spleen or um, circulation or something like that. Just some very basic things. It's just a few terms that were slightly, slightly different initially, but also um, in terms of um, uh, general discussions, there's just some some sort of understanding is, is, is slightly different. So it's, it's yeah, you need to start to learn that 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 kind of slang almost. It's very easy. It's very quickly you adapt to it, uh, and vice versa as well. You bring in some terms that may be misunderstood by, for example, a neuroscientist initially when you come from pure immunology. Very well. The the others too. I know, like like Peter, for example, you are about to venture in a new field. Have you had? Similar experiences, how are you dealing with them? Well, the other people that I've heard talking uh, so far, I mean, the speakers and, and also Yvonne, uh, are people that have gone to the field of neuroimmunology, interactions between the immune system and, and the, the, uh, the nervous system. And um, I'm, I'm a bit different in that I'm a, a, a neurophysiologist. I've, I've worked on the nervous system most of my life. And all of a sudden, I decided to move into immunology, but I haven't really brought the two together at all. But if it's if I've done interdisciplinary research, it's translating some of the ideas uh, and some of the techniques from the nervous system uh, into the immune system. And particularly, we've been, been interested in immune cell chemotaxis and what drives that. So it's a rather different type of interdisciplinary approach. And how did you how did you find your way through all the different vocabulary and ideas of the different fields? Um, well, I, I got into immunology really because I had to lecture on it, and I have to say, having to lecture on a field is is a, a scarifying experience because all of a sudden, in in front of a group of about three hundred very smart students. Um, you, you have to attempt not to ex expose your ignorance. Uh, so I boned up on this field, which I thought was very interesting. And one of the things that struck me was that um, immunologists talk about immune cells, such as neutrophils or macrophages or whatever, uh, finding their ways to, to their bacterial targets. Uh, and, um, you know, I asked some immunologists, well, how do they do this? And they said, oh, they travel up a gradient of cytokines, of course. So I said, OK, yes, fair enough. I understand that. But how do they how do the immune cells detect the cytokines and how do they drive themselves forward in response to that gradient? And the general answer was, well, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm sure it's known. It's, it was discovered many, many years ago, so long ago that I've forgotten. So I, I got into the literature and sort of looked around a bit, and, and I discovered that it actually wasn't known. So since uh, my lab is very good at doing things like calcium imaging and working on iron channels, that's basically what we do, uh, we decided to set out and try to find out how neutrophils get to their targets. And, and it certainly turned out that the, the answer was not known, and I think we discovered the answer. So uh, that was sort of a, a really an application of techniques from neuroscience uh, to a different problem in the immune system. I see, I see. And of course, Francisca, you should definitely share your opinion on this. Have you experienced anything similar? Yeah, totally. Hi, Yvonne, by the way. It's really nice to see you again. Peter and I are in the same building, so we see each other more often. Um, yeah, I totally agree with what has been said. And Yvonne, you're right, the terms are quite different. So with my, I'm a neuroscientist um, by background. In fact, I'm a psychologist by training. <laughs> and then I got into pain research and, and because pain is so intimately connected to inflammation, that's why I'm now interested in, in neuroimmune stuff. And my immunological collaborators, for instance, terms like activation or recruitment, right? So in the nervous system, we talk about recruitment, we talk about more neurons that start firing. The immunologist is recruitment, okay, so where are the cells coming in and out? I, I, and mainly this idea that for most neuroscientists, cells aren't moving, yeah? So you don't have to worry about that. The immunologists are constantly worrying about movement, like when do you have to eject the tamoxifen? When will the cells come back? We kind of, we never worry about that. Um, methods are very different, like optogenetics. I've literally had like very prominent immunologists send the Wikipedia link to optogenetics like a year ago, you know, to the other immunologists to explaining this is what optogenetics is, right? Because it's a, it's a neuroscience thing. 
Similarly, I didn't know about KD mice, which are very routinely used in immunology. So there is a lot of, I find the gulf to be really quite drastic. Um, and it, it, I agree with Yvonne, it's rewarding to, to try and bridge it. Do you want to share some of the strategies you would use right now with all your experiences to, to maybe be efficient about learning about the other field? I mean, I think just having nice collaborators, people you enjoy working with, I think the further away, you do need people that are as committed as you are. It takes time, right? It is a bit tedious. You, you won't be the expert at all. You're both kind of asking really dumb questions like, oh, where are the, what's a B cell again? And how does this FC receptor thing work? <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. Um, so don't be afraid, I guess, to not know. That's totally fine. Um, and then find people that you like and that are willing to, to put in the time maybe um, that would be my advice um, and don't be scared to you know ask several people you, you don't always have to follow all the advice you can ask around right? what does this person say that person said that person say you say thank you very much wonderful every time and then at the end you decide which you know what you're going to take forward I don't know Yvonne Peter what you guys think about that yeah I completely agree um, don't be afraid to ask dumb question I think everyone in the other field is very happy to educate you because they like talking about their research I found it very very easy to reach out what I did I went to a lot of neuroscience conferences as an immunologist and it was ooh, yeah it was a bit over my head at the start but I forced myself out there I went there and I think that helped me a lot as well at the start and yeah as Francisca said um, just talk to people um, and don't be afraid to say I know nothing I'm from a different field. Educate me, please. Um, I've never, ever had, um, uh, you know, someone saying, sorry, um, no, don't want to. Maybe, sorry, I don't have time right now. Um, maybe we can catch up in a week or two. Yeah. But yeah, conference, I'd say, and reach out to people, talk to them, learn. I like the idea. I would always compare it also to how one learns a new language, right? So at the beginning, basically, you don't know a single word, but somehow you start off like a little child trying to, to speak one or two and to read and basically just to get acquainted with the language. This is why I really like the idea of going to the conferences, right? It's not to go there to understand everything and leave as a complete uh, master of the field, but rather to just get around people who talk like this, who use these words, and then you get more or less used to them, right? You, you basically get a, get a feeling for this overall to, to, again, get acquainted and let your head learn without you necessarily consciously realizing that you do. So since, since I'm a student basically trying to, to connect to fields, of course, I, I can also speak from experience that, it's, that it is not easy, but Francisca, you have been so to say, co-founding a program for neuroimmunology. Uh, maybe you also want to share some um, interesting insights you had, maybe some of the experiences also you have seen PhD students starting there. Uh, what were they expecting? What did they have to learn? Like give us a little uh, of, your, of your rich experience there. Yeah, th thank you, Patrick. Yeah, so our program, the, the way it works is that each student is supervised by a sort of card-carrying immunologist and a card-carrying neuroscientist. And we're sort of forcing them together with the promise of a student. So Patrick, you asked me once who were the neuroimmunologists. The students are the neuroimmunologists, yeah. The supervisor are neuroscientists in immunology. So it, it is a bit tougher for the student because they have to kind of marry those two things. But generally, the, the people that volunteer to supervise on our course are quite happy to, you know, try and bridge that gap and have these communications. So, so it works quite well. It's sort of self-selecting. And in terms of what's the most challenging, I actually think because of the program, we're making it sort of easy for students to learn, you know, to get the best or like to, to, to get the kind of cutting edge of the techniques in both fields and get the background from both fields. Yeah. And um, the hardest thing I think for them is the operational side, admin side. You have to mm. manage two labs, basically two lab meetings, two different conferences. Da, da, da. So it kind of makes you very good. It makes you, I think, quite organized. <laughs> so I think that's actually the most challenging of the program. Not, I think the actual interdisciplinarity we're making slightly easier because we're already putting them together with two experts from two different fields. Mm -hmm. But how about the communication there? Like I could imagine that uh, as we've discussed already, right? You have to find the right words to use with both of them because they might be from different backgrounds. 
Or have people been dealing with that? Yeah, I think because normally they have meetings, the three of them. And so I think they kind of quite quickly, you start to learn. And, and so as long as you have someone there, and then sometimes, I mean, I know for myself, you know, when there's, I, I co-supervise with um, Leonie Tams, who's a T-cell biologist. So when the meeting switches to some question about T-cells, I sometimes zone out a little bit and I, I trust that she will know. <laughs> and I think vice versa. And then if it's sort of more conceptual, sometimes you have to. So I think in, in that sense, it's actually, yeah, so I, that hasn't been that much of an issue or less, less of an issue, I think, yeah. No, that is good to hear because yeah. passing it back to, to Peter, I know that we have had some, some discussion there also about like overall research, right? If we go now, um, look overall at how, how scientists are thinking, we still see sometimes some barriers in terms of thinking interdisciplinary about people, so to say, crossing their minds. So. Uh, Peter, maybe share a little bit of, of your experience there, if you like, and also uh, what you think will be necessary in the future for, for scientists, how to change their thinking to basically excel in this world of, of interdisciplinary research. Well, it's certainly true that um, we all have our comfort zones. I, I don't criticize because I have my own comfort zone. And uh, people in the immune cell field are, are accustomed to speaking in certain ways, and thinking in certain ways, which have served them well over the year. I, 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 years, I, I, I do not condemn this at all. And, and we neuroscientists have our sort of, not only ways of thinking, but we also tend to have a ranking of the problems in our mind uh, that we think that, yeah, these are the really important ones and these are the less important ones. And probably the interactions between neurons and the immune system uh, is one of the less important ones we would think about. So I, I think ideally people need to sort of jerk themselves out of these um, sort of perhaps rather comfortable, but also slightly lazy ways of thinking and think differently. I mean, there's a lot of evidence, for instance, coming from the uh, people with a more psychiatric bent that things like uh, depression and schizophrenia are, are intimately involved with the, the immune system. And, you know, that's been a sort of the idea that uh, the two might be interacting in an important, important way was really sort of, it's, it seemed intolerable at first and people really resisted it and didn't believe it. But, you know, now the evidence is becoming rather overwhelming. So, uh, yes, I, I think uh, if you can actually get two fields and kind of bang their heads together in the way that... Uh, Francisca is trying to do with her, her uh, new initiative for the PhD students. I, I think you really can get great um, advances from that. Does that answer your question, Patrick, or did you want no, to? No, no, it does, it does, it does. I, I just, I'm just keeping a little time always for the other two to answer because I think this also links very well to, to what Yvonne just said a, a couple of minutes ago, right? That having these different backgrounds also can help you basically excel your own your, your own research. Maybe one of you want to dig a little bit deeper there to give people examples like what, what you have experienced and how far this was actually helpful to you. Yeah, so for example, um, when I started out in neuroimmunology um, as a postdoc, I came with a completely different set of skills and um, uh, methodologies that I applied to my postdoctoral research. I was able to drive that topic and um, to, to finish basically this project. And we, we not just only worked in neuroimmunology, we worked basically around the disease MS that um, Olga really nicely um, described just um, a few minutes ago. Um, but we also combined it with regeneration, tissue regeneration that was new for the entire group back then. So um, basically um, with my uh, techniques from the previous tumor immunology and skin innate immunity field, I could drive um, the new project that um, um, was the key for that for that uh, group that I started neuroimmunology in with um, to drive it forward and uh, to get the, the project basically published um, uh, in a, it took a while. That was maybe, maybe um, a challenge because we had to establish a lot of new things because we included the regeneration aspect um, as well. So we had to learn a lot of things and had to reach out to collaborators to help me learning techniques and established techniques. But also because of the, the freshness of ideas and um, bringing in different methodology into the neuroimmunology or neuroscience field, we were able to drive the project successfully forward and eventually were able to basically conclude it and publish it. 
So I found that was um, quite helpful. I think um, probably my PI back then for, for um, shows she had actually, and that I found quite um, interesting because I asked her, why did you choose me? So when I applied for the position, I just, you know, I found the idea interesting. I, I loved going elsewhere. I loved Ireland. <laughs> so all the right things to start a career elsewhere. And it's often the personal things. Um, anyways, um, I came to Belfast. I asked my PI, so why did you choose me? There are other applicants who have a neuroscience background. I don't have a neuroscience background. Why did you choose me? And she said, yeah, I, had, I brought the right ideas. I, I just, when she put problems in front of me during the interview, I had came from a completely different angle and she wanted to see that. So she took a risk with me as well as I took a risk with her because I could have failed and not brought the project forward. She could have employed basically me and not brought the project forward and missing out a, a good project and publication, but we both benefited from it. I think that worked, worked out um, quite well, but it did take a little bit more time because um, I was new to the field. So this is maybe something to consider that some things may take a little bit longer when starting into this disciplinary research, just due to establishing methodologies, et cetera. No, I think this is a very important point because especially at the beginning of whatever research you do, but especially in the beginning of a PhD, right? You have to be ready that most things you will start are not going to work out the first time you try them. And especially if you do not have right away the experts next to you, because maybe you're doing some neurological stuff where people know about, but with the neuroscientific stuff, it might be a bit more difficult. And then you really need to, to keep up the resilience Maybe all three of you, because I think this is a very important point, might share a little bit their opinion about uh, resilience and what, what helped you basically to, to stay resilient and, and motivated throughout the, let's say, rather difficult and sometimes tedious times of research. Francisca, you can go ahead if you like. Yeah, so definitely none of you should worry at all. I think it's completely normal. I mean, especially at the start of your PhD that everything's frustrating, it's all difficult. I think quite often, at least in the UK, maybe in other European countries as well, PhD projects tend to be the ones that are the most risky because they're sort of the least, you know, like, the, yeah, let's try, you figure that out, yeah? You go and see whether you can get this microscope to work or whatever. <laughs> so it's fine if it, totally fine if it doesn't work, totally fine if most things don't work at first. Um, just kind of, I guess my two pieces of advice would be, yeah, definitely don't get dispirited. I think PhD is usually inverted you in terms of mood. You start off super excited and then you're like, oh my God, oh my God, you hate it in your second year. You hate like your supervisor. Then it goes back up and then you finish and it's all great. Um, and my second piece of advice would be do, do make sure that you cut and run soon enough. So you kind of have to know at what point to stop hitting your head against the wall. So you hit it for a little while. But then at some point there has to be like hard stop. Okay, you've tried for six months. It's not going anywhere. This is clearly not going to work. Um, let's do something else. But I think it's it's fine for that to happen. The, the whole point is that we're doing research. So none of us know what we're doing. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I really like this. I mean, it's difficult to find a sweet spot, right? To say like, when do you need to push on and when it when it's time to to switch and to change. And I think that comes in again, what you already mentioned to say you have experts around the world, right? I mean, it can be maybe your, your PI, it can be the postdoc in your lab, but um, as we want to show here with the with IUB and BTI, with the Fab Junior section, with this new eyebrow, there are always people around the world which you can just contact, so to say, right? I mean, it's certainly possible to just reach out, write an email, whatever it is, even to maybe authors of a paper to just say like, hey, uh, would you hey, maybe have five minutes to, to, to meet because I have a question or something? I think this is certainly possible and nobody should be afraid uh, to do this because the worst thing that can happen is that you don't get an answer, right? And then that's it. There's nothing, nothing worse than this, uh, what can happen. So Peter, what is, what is your take? What would you well, advise people? Well, I was going to say, uh, uh, my, my main advice to, to young scientists, if I was to give any, uh, is is uh, don't do boring stuff. Uh, it, you know, when I was a PhD student, I thought, hey, I could uh, uh, do a couple of minor extensions to this work and we could publish a little paper and that would make my CV look good. 
but uh, often these minor extensions of other people's work don't turn out to be very interesting, I'm afraid. Often, unfortunately, you find their work is wrong, and that's not very exciting to publish. So, I, I mean, don't, don't do boring stuff. Be a bit ambitious. Um, I, I, I don't know if you'd like to hear another story about my life, but um, this, this might be a, another example of interdisciplinary research. So we were studying, as I said, a neuroscience lab studying neutrophil chemotaxis. And I was very fortunate to have a, a, a rather senior scientist from India who visited my lab for a year. And he brought with him a, a natural compound library. So I was thinking of something to suggest that he could do. So I said, well, you've got this library. Why don't you try it out on neutrophils? And this turned out to be a stunningly good idea because we, we found a sub-nanomolar sub hit. Now, uh, drug companies, when they try to develop new drugs, they look for hits, things that work on the target, and then they try to improve them. And, you know, sort of something that works at 10 micromolar is a good start. I mean, this was four orders of magnitude more potent. It wasn't a hit, it was the final drug. So we sort of wondered what we should do about this for a while. But then the COVID pandemic came along and it was clear I knew very little about viral diseases, but this was another area that I was about to enter. Uh, uh, little did I know. Um, but it was clear that uh, COVID was killing people. Not wasn't the virus that was killing people. It was the, react, the overreaction of their innate immune system and particularly neutrophils, which was invading their lungs releasing cytokines, causing inflammation, lungs filled with fluid, they can't breathe, and, and unfortunately, many, many of them died. So there was this period of absolute panic in the sci scientific community, which I felt as well. You know, how can we tackle this imminent threat to the lives of everybody in the world, to our friends, and a couple of my friends did die from COVID. How can we tackle it? This is a challenge to the science, scientific community. And in fact, the, the, the answer came from a rather obvious source, which was developing new uh, vaccines, and that's been hugely successful, but sort of wind back when, when those vaccines were not available. And, uh, you know, people were dying like flies all over the place. So I, I thought, well, if we can inhibit neutrophils, maybe this is going to work. So my, my, the, the department was dark, nobody was allowed to come in, etc. But I got special permission to work on this compound that we had uh, to see if it would inhibit neutrophil chemotaxis. Now, did this provide a cure in COVID? No, it didn't. But we succeeded in persuading the World Health Organization, who were looking for ideas to, to take forward to clinical trials. Uh, to take this, this idea on board. Now, I would love to be able to say we persuaded the WHO, they did the clinical trial, and hey, it worked, but the clinical trial hasn't yet reported. But this is, has sort of thrust me into a new area as well, which is uh, clinical medicine, about which I'm not clinically qualified and about which I know little, uh, apart, from, <laughs> apart from as a subject now and again, nothing, nothing serious, I have to say. Um, so even though the COVID pandemic has, has mainly, I think, finished, um, this could apply, this idea could apply to many other areas, such as sepsis. I mean, sepsis is, you know, a, 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 when a bacterial infection, as it often is, overwhelms the body's uh, reserves and the immune system, the innate immune system, instead of helping us to repel the infection, uh, it's such a toxic thing, the innate immune system, when it's present on a body-wide level, uh, it, it, it can be damaging, and well, more than damaging, it can be fatal. So that might be a moment where it would be a good idea to be able to switch off the immune system, just turn the key. And, and we still don't know how to do that. So we're looking at, at, at we're thinking about looking at sepsis, and, and also about things like winter flu that kill large numbers of people every winter, um, something called ARDS, acute respir respiratory distress syndrome, which is, is very common, often precipitated by winter flu, etc. So I, I, I do think that this, um, 
idea about neutrophils and how to switch them off may be valuable or maybe not. I shouldn't boast too much because it's still very much at the, the thinking stage. But you know, this has been a new world for me, how to deal with clinicians, how to persuade them to start clinical trials uh, with an idea which is basically mine and you have to do a lot of persuasion, I'm afraid. And uh, lovely, lovely clinical colleagues. And it looks as though my uh, uh, career is gonna take another, another right turn into yet another area. Sorry for that long and anecdote, but I thought it might be entertaining. No, no worries. No worries, Peter, there at all. I mean, most people actually seeing this will probably do it online, so they can always have the opportunity to, to jump ahead later on the recording. But I don't think they will, because what you said, I think, is quite motivating, right, to, to really in, engage people in their work and saying, hey, go for something that is really exciting. Um, I would still encourage you to dig a little bit deeper for people, maybe especially starting their research, like you have said, when you're trying to basically, you know, only extend the work of others, you might find that they have been wrong. Uh, would you mind sharing with us your experience there? What, what have you seen in your own life? Of finding other people wrong. I think, yes. I think every scientist would um, often encounter that. So you see a nice uh, paper in nature or something like that, and you decide to pick up on it and, and have a look and see, see how maybe extend it into a different field. Uh, into your own field, for instance. And, and, and then, you know, when you look into it, it, it just collapses like a house of cards in front of you. But unfortunately, that's not a very happy outcome because publishing papers that destroy the reputation of other authors is, is kind of a nasty thing to do. And it's not something I would ever like to do. So I, I have to say, when we discover that a paper is fundamentally flawed, uh, we, we tend just to walk away. Um, maybe that's the wrong approach. But um, so finding other people wrong is is morally destroying, and it also I think doesn't take you very far. Um, so I, I've always been sort of popping into new fields and sort of picking up ideas that we can take forward rather than really discrediting other people. Yeah, it, it, it might be, so to say, or feel like rather, like, like a dark topic, but I think also many of these things might exactly come from people very much working within their own field and staying there and ignoring what other effects there might be, right? Just talking about immune activity, you forget there are nerves in the skin as well. There are fibroblasts in the skin that might have some activity. Other way around, Neural factors, right? You, you work on psychiatric disease and you forget there's immune system driving all of this. Mm -hmm. I think this is, it's quite interesting to say if you see such a house of cards, just to give it a second thought in terms of what might the authors have not been thinking about, what maybe you can bring to the table and, and you can consider there. And this basically then creating your own research from, from the bottom up with, so to say, their help, right? Instead of discrediting them to say like, hey, uh, we have found the mechanism behind it. We have found basically what was driving this, what you might not have been able to explain. Mm. But therefore, passing it on to T1, maybe you still want to share uh, what, what's your take on resilience and how people stay upbeat about the research. Um, so, well, resilience, I think, is one of the most important things you learn during your PhD or in research in general. Um, and I completely agree with. Um, with Francisca, um, there should be a time when if one approach or different approaches haven't worked to move on, but at the same time, also not to give up too early, um, to bring people in to help you. you. You're not alone with dealing with a problem. Others will not solve it for you, but conversations with others or help, or just, you know, discussion over coffee may help um, to, to spark a new idea. Um, so my advice would also be to not give up too early, but give yourself a deadline. And because PhD um, funding will run out eventually, you don't have, in your case, usually three or four years. You, it sounds like a long time when you start off, but it actually, it's running down very fast that time. The, the clock is ticking from the start. So set yourself a time when this is not working and also have an honest discussion um, with your supervisory team about what you have tried. Um, is there anything else you could do? Or is there maybe a way to, to bypass that problem or to move on to a different one? And my second um, 
uh, a thought on that would be also to trust your supervisory team and people around you. Basically, if they tell you when you're in a dip, you're down there uh, and you don't see you will be ever up again on another, you know, um, high flying high and have fantastic results. Trust them. We've all been there. We are probably currently in one of our own dips um, and know there will be light at the end of the tunnel. So it will not come automatically. It, you will need to work towards it, but you will not stuck at the, at the bottom of a dip forever. Um, so knowing this, um, I think it will be very helpful no matter what you will be doing in your future. If you stay in academia, if you go to industry, doing something completely different, this resilience that you really learn and you can only learn by doing this um, and getting through it, this will help you throughout the rest of your, your life, in your personal life, in your professional life, it will just help you. And that's, I think, one of the most rewarding things to, to have that and to build up this resilience. Yeah, I yeah. agree, Yvonne. I think the science is a beautiful metaphor for life, really. You can do everything right and still get, you know, punished, so to speak. And, and it teaches you to to be okay with that and 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 to kind of focus on the positives and like you were saying many people don't stay in academia and that's probably quite a wise choice so um this resilience is one of the great transferable skills that that you learn as well as organizing your time and if you're in the interdisciplinary space you know managing different opinions and views yeah it's 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 wonderful wonderful what you both said right on the one hand to always see the light at the end of the tunnel so to say to to know that there's going to be a bright future on the one hand um but but especially then uh to say like i mean there are always other opportunities you can take right this is this is off uh, this is no question however um also to to challenge you guys a little bit uh before we leave i wanted to ask the three of you what haven't we talked about what you would like to share right and of course this is entirely open if it's a tip if it's an experience, a story, if it is maybe um, a shout out to say like, hey, science or scientists should do more like whatever it might be. So what is what is your take on what haven't we just yet touched on? And well, perhaps if I could uh, just follow on from something that uh, Yvonne was talking about, which is, you know, when you're a, a young scientist and stuff isn't working and you're not making progress and things. I, I, I really think that's that's a time to talk to your supervisor or to other senior scientists in the department and try to get their advice. And I'm surprised how uh, little uh, PhD students in, in our place actually do that. Um, there are lots of people out there to talk to and a lot of them would be really, really happy to talk. I, I, I think one of the things you do gain a little bit uh, in, in being in science for quite a long time um, it is a feeling about something which uh, is going to be productive and isn't going to be productive. And uh, I mean, there was a, a case recently in my lab, which I, I don't need to go into, but um, you know, the, there was a very puzzling set of observations and we just couldn't put them together. And uh, a PhD student who, who was looking into this um, sort of gave me a number of options for what it could be that was the answer and she mentioned one that i'd never heard about and i just thought hey that's it that's got to be right and so i mean <laughs> i was able to feed that in this has got to be right let's do some experiments and it turned out to be right actually i don't want to boast here but i think being around in science for quite a long time you you do get a feeling for which may not be obvious to somebody who's younger uh, what the way forward is Terrific, terrific. I, I I like it. Um, but what I have to say, I like the most about this is obviously to say like, oh, I've never heard about this. Somehow I think it must be it, and then it's true, right? Because sometimes this is so exciting about science that you say it's it's a thing you would never have thought that this would be either the solution or sometimes it's something doesn't work that you have to change this in order to make it work, right? So mm -hmm. um, I think Francisca mentioned it like. We are, we are scientists in terms of like, we're just asking questions and trying things out, right? We are less predicting what is going to happen and more like um, probing, one might say. Yeah, but sometimes banging your head against a brick wall is not the right thing to do. Sometimes taking another angle on the project, perhaps using a different technique or something is, is what you need to do. So uh, uh, this sounds like giving up, but I'm actually in a bit of 
I'm a bit of a fan of giving up. If you're doing something and you're doing all the right things and it's not working, then you need to look for a change. And that's mm -hmm. not giving up. It's just taking another tack on the problem. Or maybe the problem is mistaken and it's time you sort of went home for the weekend, had a couple of good drinks and thought up a new problem. I like it. I like it. Oh, very positive. Francisca, you wanted to say something, but we I think we interrupted you. Oh, no, I don't think. No, no, no. I was just going to say, you, you were saying, what didn't we mention? I want to have a quick shout out for the more boring seeming, I think, reproducibility, working in big teams, you know, sometimes actually the things that really change things in life, you know, for society are the, you know, boring pencil pushers in some office who make sure that 200 people work together in some big clinical trial. And that's where we can sometimes get, um, you know, reproducible, solid data. So don't forget about that. Do focus on that. Ultimately, that's what's going to help us forward. It can sometimes seem, oh, yeah, Nobel Prize and blah, blah. Yeah. But behind every Nobel Prize, there is like 250 people um, that you've never heard of, and they've done great work, and they made sure that that all of this happened. So it's really a collective. So shout out to the collective. <laughs> yeah, I don't have to add much more to this. Maybe I come from a Maybe one more thought is mentors. We've mentioned already the supervisors who are not necessarily your mentors because they have um, maybe some different agenda. So, and I'm not also not talking about these uh, more official mentoring programs, which might be good for people to get started into what is mentoring should, but really seek your mentors. And that is basically having someone to talk to who you trust who doesn't have their own agenda, um, who are just very happy to give you advice. You do not have to take that. Um, it's completely up to you. But um, I feel there's a lot of effort on the, on the formal mentoring programs, which can work for some people, but it's more forced, basically, the, the role of the mentor and the mentee. So I would suggest um, to just ask someone who you want their opinion on to, if you can buy them a coffee, uh, most of the PIs that I know would love to get out of their office and have a chat with someone young and enthusiastic. Um, they would love to give career advice, love to give advice in every sort of aspect, research, etc. I think this is really something maybe in the background of a project as well that can really help lead to success, having the right mentors, not just in terms of research, but also in, in further career advice and also non-career advice in terms of work-life balance, et cetera. So I'd say this is one point that should always be in the back of someone's mind to seek the right mentors. And they don't have to have labels like you're my mentor now. Could be just a one-off, could be occasional meetings, et cetera. I like this. I like this also because it resonates very well with what we are trying to promote, right? You can just reach out, especially the idea with, hey, why don't we go for a coffee, right? Uh, get outside, right? I mean, already seeing the sky, having the fresh air around you gives you a completely new mindset to think about problems, issues, and then find a solution for them, hopefully, or eventually, we should say, maybe. All right, you guys. Thank you so much. Um, we, we still have a few minutes left, so I will be able to, to do a shout out to some other events we're going to launch. But again, thank you so, so much for for all of your input, for your experiences, for the stories you shared. And I'm, I'm super sure that this will be very helpful to people. You've been talking about so many things and I think we can summarize for sure that everybody should just do whatever excites them to, uh, to more or less paraphrase Peter here. And then and as Francisca, there's, there's so many things you can do, right? Work with a big team if you have one around, if they don't go your own way. It is basically all up to you and it should be really you who's creating their own path and to do whatever uh, whatever excites you the most, right? I mean, orientate towards what is really amazing to you, what you think is going to be worth it. So again, well, science, thank science is exciting. I still find it enormously exciting. I love doing science. It's a privilege to do it. And so somebody that I knew well, Alan Hodgkin, the Nobel Prize winner for the discovery of the mechanism of nerve conduction, uh, he, he, he once said to me, he said, like, I can't believe I'm paid for this. He said, you know, it's, a, it's, it's so exciting. I would do this even if I didn't get paid. <laughs> I love this. I love this. And I think this is the passion, right? I mean, if you start to think about it as work, everything will be dragging and difficult. But if you think about it as this is something I would love to do, I just like it. I'm so curious to find out. It will give you a whole new 
attitude and therefore also what we talked about resilience right that everything will feel just different yeah i have to say excitement in science it's it's, it's a bit spiky this this excitement and then this long boring time spent trudging through the the sort of mechanistic basics of science to get to your ne next little spike <laughs> but it's worth it it's worth it it is worth it so guys thank you so much again uh, it was a pleasure to have you Bye bye. And thank, thank you, Patrick. No, thank you. Thank you for your time. And for everybody who is still here, if you're interested in what is coming up next. So basically, just today, we, we got some input from the IUBMB, and they have been telling us that at the end of July, basically, um, they will have their, their next event. And what you will be able to, to see and hear, basically, is about marketing yourself uh, for careers and an academic path, right, in the industry mainly. And so what you can do is you can hear from Dr. Kyle Hess about his career path and advice for transitioning. And also from uh, Dr. Arshun Raj um, and his career path and his practical advice to, to get a position. And this I think might be quite useful for you, whatever you want to look into, whatever path you want to take. If you're more interested in sustainability, that is environmental footprint of science, feel free to register right here with the QR code. We'll also put the link into the, into the chat in just a minute. Um, exploring the environmental footprint of science, right? Here we will share some numbers, impact strategies, discover some concrete examples, what you can do uh, in your own research to make it more sustainable. And I think this is really exciting to see uh, basically what and how research and environment are closely connected and how to, so to say, upgrade your own attitudes. And finally, from the FAPS junior section, um, we will have an associate professor talking about um, towards an evolutionary driven universal therapy against intracellular pathogens. So here you have really something exciting from science. Also, he will be invited by the Italian section of the Federal European Biochemical Societies so all of you, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we hope you enjoy it. And if there's anything we can help you with, uh, always feel free to reach out. And with this, I can only say again, thank you very much and hope you enjoyed. Have a good evening and see you next time. Bye-bye.